Welcome, Jimmy Nelson. Good morning. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, um, special is debatable, but let's say unique perspective. And I think that's the sort of journey we're going to go on in the next hour. Wonderful. So maybe the first place where we can start off mm. is uh, basically the thing we want to know is can we use technology in a helpful way uh, to make us understand more about the indigenous people, uh, their role in the world, our own role in the world, or can technology only be a hindrance? And the, perhaps the place to where we can start mm -hmm. off is that you have a very beautiful app mm -hmm. uh, which mm -hmm. people can use, which is very, very beautiful, and you can use that to learn more about the ancient cultures and their traditions and uh, so on and so forth. So, so maybe we can start off with you talking a bit how you ended up doing that. Mm -hmm. It's a, um, thank you for the introduction. It's a massive question. Uh, whether I can answer it in the next hour is debatable, but I'm going to try. Uh, to begin with, this app I use within my little creative organization. Uh, it was not initiated by me, it was not designed by me, it was not created by me. It actually also wasn't my idea, it was my colleagues. I work with uh, seven wonderful uh, women. And they decided that we had to go on this extended journey, this journey which we're about to discuss. How can I bring that insight, that unique uh, perspective, experience into the developed world? Uh, but also at the same time, uh, how we can reconnect or re-inspire the indigenous communities, cultures to believe they have a validity. So it's bridging the two worlds. Um, that's the objective of the app. The app is every single picture I've had the opportunity to make and I show is digitally accessible with the app, with a smartphone. Uh, you uh, scan it over the image, you press on the icon, the eye, and you get taken into a two-dimensional world of film footage perspective of me working in the environment, uh, commentary from me, and also a variety of interviews and context from the indigenous cultures themselves. So it's trying to, the picture, the photograph is a portal, a door uh, into another world. So right now, over the course of, let's say, the past 10, 15, mm -hmm. 20 years, how have you seen uh, the impact of technology uh, on those indigenous people? Have you seen mostly positive, mostly negative? Uh, is it a mixed bag? It's um, in transition. I would say 50% of the communities I now get to visit are now online in one way or another, uh, which is quite uh, uh, beautiful, but at the same time confronting. Uh, they also track me and monitor me on my journey and how I communicate it and often correct me when I'm right and often, more often not when I'm wrong. So that's one interesting perspective. Also, I would argue uh, from their perspective, it's positive because they are finding a way to put in the context the validity of their authenticity. And I think that's the, the, the bigger journey that we're all on together in our, the developed world. Uh, the access we have to technology is extraordinary, uh, but at the same time daunting because we are uh, rapidly leaving the human experience. And I think the conversation I would aspire to have with you in the next few minutes is how you can keep that in balance, how we can indulge, uh, inspire, dare to de deep dive into the technological digital world, but at the same time uh, remain human. So if we're sort of entering the metaphor how do we keep the human verse valid and in balance running parallel next to it? Because both are important. One needs the other. So yeah. it's basically we have a lot of power, but that power has to be balanced with wisdom. And in our world, we seem to lack the wisdom. Well, it has to be balanced with humanity. It has to be balanced with human beings. And I think the, the, the thrill of the technological world is that it's taking us far and far, further and further away from what it is to feel to be human. And we were discussing it on the way here. That idea of daring, that idea of curiosity, that idea of adventure, that idea of being authentic, but physically feeling it in one's own human form. The digital world is disconnecting and making us actually, I would argue, although I'm now middle-aged, so I wasn't born up with digital technology, lazy. 
And that's my biggest fear. So the journey I'm on is uh, I work with a team of substantially younger people who are trying to, they grew up in the digital world, reapply and use the, the insight, the organic insight that I've uh, gathered, and, and spread it for the better reuse of connection of what it is to be human. So I have this belief uh, that uh, mostly the cultures that you visit, mm -hmm. because they're so connected to nature, there is a transcendence, there is a transcendent mm -hmm. aspect to their life, the mm -hmm. way of living, connected mm -hmm. with some mm -hmm. deeper spirit, something, uh, mm -hmm. something that we can't explain, something mm -hmm. very mystical, something mm -hmm. uh, awe-inspiring and mm -hmm. wonderful. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that we have lost in the modern world. Mm -hmm. But because the human soul still has a deep yearning for that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we still try to find a transcendence. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we have projected all of those feelings now into the digital world mm -hmm. and into the metaverse. Because mm -hmm. again, it can mm -hmm. help us expand mm -hmm. in some sort of a way to experience so much but mm -hmm. it's again it's this numb mm -hmm. sort of experiencing mm -hmm. because it, it isn't connected to anything deeper I, I think I think it's you're right but it's very 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 simple it's a it's a uh, humility and vulnerability and ego and when you combine all those three human aspects together you can be as you described it, spiritually connected to oneself, one another, and the natural world in the healthiest possible way. When you enter the, when we are entering the metaverse, you don't need to park those three aspects. You can actually take them with you because you never actually really need to fail because you just have to turn the on-off button if things are not going, we say in English, if things are going pear-shaped. And I think that's the biggest uh, uh, issue is that it, it's not the authentic experience of what it is to be human because there's an escape button, there's get out clause so you never truly submit or commit to the human experience anymore you don't need to because you can design and there are many escape hatches from it in when you're in, you're living in the present we were discussing it as a human with one another with one's culture in the natural world there is no get out clause there is no escape hatch there is no re rescue button it's very much more of an authentic experience so how do you run that and bring that parallel into this extraordinary world that we're now living with this extraordinary world of possibility technological possibility but how do you keep it human so how would you say that the indigenous people that now have technology that have smartphones mm -hmm. how have they handled having them. Uh, are they getting just as lost as we are? Or? I would argue no. Again, this is very uh, uh, subjective from my experience. I would argue no, because what they do, and we have stopped doing in the, in the developed world, is they hold age uh, as authority, and, uh, uh, and they put it on a pedestal. So the generations that did not grow up with this access to the digital world are still highly respected, highly honored, regarded as the most beautiful, the wisest, the richest people within the communities. And they have this, this healthy perspective. In our world, we have kind of, we are parking age and we are parking wisdom, and we don't take it as seriously. We don't give it the same respect as we should do. So, whether that will become continuous as those generations passed and the younger generation become the older generation, I don't know. I will probably not be around then. So at the moment, they're still keeping it in check because the older generation did not have access to it and they're still respected. Yeah. Okay. And uh, what? might it be that we would have to teach the younger generations right now or what we would have to teach ourselves so that we could keep that balance without getting completely lost in the metaverse and still having our foot on solid ground? Oh, massive question. Highly complicated to answer. Um, That's why we're having the discussion. Yeah, what, what <laughs> to, to be fearless. Uh, to be fearless and to be curious, curious as a human being and to dare to want to go on that metaphorical adventure of that personal experience and not uh, delegate it to the technological world to keep that curiosity alive, to keep that daring alive, to keep that daring of failure, that daring of exploration, of human exploration alive. I think that's the most important aspect. And I think as we uh, overdevelop and we over molly coddle, you understand molly coddle? We cover ourselves with protection and fluff. We're, we're going further and further away from that authentic experience. Yeah, talking about mm. authenticity, we have mm. our first question from the QA. Okay. It's a little bit of a drift-off, mm. but it's still yeah, a good thing to ask. So Laura asked, 
Uh, there are AI tools to create fake photos of people. Mm -hmm. Do you see individuals taking advantage of those tools more? And what can we do to keep content content real, not fake? And this is very apropos because just yesterday uh, uh, one colleague of mine sent me uh, artworks made by AI that look like amazing like impressionist paintings mm -hmm. uh, from mm -hmm. the late the 19th century mm -hmm. basically it's so mm -hmm. beautiful mm -hmm. and i feel the draw like hey mm -hmm. why should i like pay an artist to do something if i can just have something like th like that so it's it's very um i i I, th I would argue that it's as valid it's as important but it is a completely different medium and we have to understand it as a different medium and we have to run it parallel, that's running these two worlds parallel to each other, keeping that balance. And rather than uh, uh, ignoring it, being angry with it, disconnecting from it, take it with us, but understand that it's a different me medium, it's a different way of communication. It's not a lie, it's not the truth, it's just a different form. Uh, it's a digital form. It's as valid, uh, much the same as in I'm overly indulging and reconnecting with analog photography. And not only am I going deep into analog photography, I'm going into very large format 10 by 8 sheet film. Um, it's not to ignore the digital world and the fact that there are three and a half billion photographers now on the planet. That's as valid. It's just a different form. It's a different medium within the same form of communication. So I would, in, uh, in, or you say in Dutch want arm it, I would gather it, I would cherish it, but understand it and take it with you as opposed to pushing it away. Beautiful. And uh, better understand it. Yeah. Uh, beautiful. Before I ask the next question, I'll just remind everybody that you can use the QR code to get to the Q&A and also to the uh, multiple choice uh, question that we uh, asked. Uh, but Carl asked, uh, what should we take from ancient world and bring to digital world in our personal lives right now? Also a very good question. Um, prior to posting, communicating, writing, illustrating uh, what you want to share, uh, connect with it in the most authentic way beforehand. There are a, a multitude of shortcuts to coming up with digital content and it is to take the least shortcut, the longest, the most circuitous way to that information, to that insight before you actually post it. Um, it's a little bit like I'm often asked uh, as, a, as a photographer, as an artist, which camera should I buy or how long should the lens be? And I often invert the question and say it's not about the camera or the lens. It's you have to decide first what you want to photograph, first what you want to share. And that may take a lifetime. And then organically you will come up with the medium with which you want to share it. So the digital world is phenomenal in how we can share. But first go on that very circuitous, dangerous, daring journey of failure and success prior to actually posting it. Rather than uh, because, it, yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Uh, did uh, we have somebody over there wanting to ask a question? Here we go. Is this? Yeah, it works. Um, so, photography perhaps isn't the best tool for capturing language, but language is one of the best technologies for capturing knowledge, and, and ancient knowledge is, to a large degree, captured in languages. Uh, at the same time, uh, digital technologies are, are built around the global languages, English predominantly, and, and the concepts and understandings and structures that the English language has, uh, losing a lot of uh, indigenous knowledge by not um, using or making use of their languages. Occasionally we do. I was, I was recently reading a piece about Kusunda language in, in Nepal, and, and we've used very successfully digital technologies to capture the only person who's, who's still fluent in, in that language to preserve the language mm -hmm. for, for posterity. Mm -hmm. But I'm just like wondering, uh, like we are here talking, mm -hmm. and, and talking is such a huge aspect of, of uh, the human experience. Mm -hmm. like, like, what, what are your views on, on that? Uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, thank you for a very good question. There, there are a number of questions in it, so maybe a, a number of answers. I'll try and focus in on one. Uh, I can only speak one and a half languages, English and Dutch. I call it Dinglish, it's my own dialect. Although I spend the, the majority of my life traveling and communicating with cultures whose language I don't speak. The thrill is um, how close can one get to that moment of intimacy, that moment of trust, without using words. 
to go to a layer further, and it becomes very physical, it becomes very metaphysical, uh, of submission, again, of humility and vulnerability, to get into a, a space, a, a safe space, whereby a community, an indigenous community, lets me in to ultimately make the picture. But it's not the picture that I aspire to make, it's the process and the journey of getting there. So that can be achieved through a sort of form of physicality and, and vulnerability long prior to the language. Now, once that is achieved, I as an artist am making a visual document to inspire others who are far more talented and capable and educated than I will ever be to transcend that, that interest, that curiosity into that, that, that aesthetic and the wisdom there behind it to bring the language forward and share it, if that makes sense. So I and myself, I'm not capable of it. It's not within my quiver of minim minimal talents to do it. But I am trying to be a catalyst to awaken other people's curiosity. For example, we were mentioning it last night, one of the most thrilling parts of the world where I have the privilege to often travel and work in is Papua New Guinea half of the world's fifth largest island, and on that island there are 1,000 independent languages. Technically speaking, again, if I'm right in saying, there are between six and 7,000 official languages in the world. That's insane on that small half island. So every valley you go into, not only is there, they're all Melanesian, of DNA, but each culture is totally and utterly different. I will spend the rest of my life, as, as long as I hope it still becomes, investigating and disappearing into those. I will never understand one word that is actually said, but I hope to become a portal of curiosity, of, ve of adventure, of failure, or often fear and humility to open up your curiosity to what's there, what lives in those valleys, and why are they all so authentic? How do they have this extraordinary way of still communicating with one another that's totally unique and why it's so important? So it's, I'm not capable of it, but I want to be and, and enable others of actually a multitude of younger generations to want to go further and, and understand. What are they saying? Why are they saying? How can they be so present, so, so, so beautiful, but in all the layers of what it is to be human in such a remote existence and in actual fact be extraordinarily wealthy? And, as regard, as, and they're regarded as sort of primitive, but it's anything but primitive. I would regard that we, in our laziness, leaning on the digital, are becoming pr primitive as a result. So it's the in inversion of that. But it's not for me, it's up to you to go on that journey of experience to feel it. Yeah. Something like that. Okay. Uh, we have two uh, very good questions again here. Uh, fr first from Elo, uh, and it's how can we keep calm in this world that has physical and digital sight and the information overflow? What is your recipe? How can we keep calm? Um, I used a small example yesterday. I've just returned from, this is how I keep calm, how you keep calm, it's difficult to. I have just taken my son, I have three kids, he's 22, on a journey, a journey of disconnection, but it was actually a journey of reconnection. I took him for three and a half weeks to northern Pakistan. Uh, to the most uh, uh, concise group of high altitude ma mountains on the planet. We went all the way up to the border of the Pamir Mountains on the border of Afghanistan. And a multitude of Taliban were actually in Pakistan. So we went on a journey which everybody said you should not do. It's very dangerous. There's no digital connection. He is incapable of surviving this journey just because it's your need to, to take risks. I went on this journey with him to disconnect him or to bring him back into balance. He is a 22-year-old, lives online. Um, he was fearful, but he was willing to do it. The, we went for three and a half weeks. The first week he cried, he vomited, he had diarrhea, and he had a panic attacks. A combination of the environment that he was in and being digitally disconnected. The second week he went totally silent. And on the third week we were walking down a valley surrounded by mountains over 7,000 square meters and there was a landslide just behind us in the path. And prior to that, he'd spent the last 22 years hearing that these people that live in this environment are lethal, they're dangerous, they're going to shoot you, they're going to kill you, they're wearing all these headbands, etc., etc. And this group of Taliban ended up jumping on us to protect us from the, the landslide. 
And uh, we came out of it that evening. We sat down. He burst out into tears, and he said, "This is one of the most. This is probably the most profound experience I've ever had, because you've taken me out of my uh, comfort zone, my 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 world of safety. I thought I was on an adventure, but I'm very far removed from that venture because you've taken me back into the real world, the real world of humility, of fear, of danger, of possibility, of humanity. Some of the most beautiful people he said I'll have ever met in my life. If I go online, I'm told they're lethal and they want to destroy the planet. But here we are in this environment which is overly empowering, makes me very humble. I was about to die and they saved me. So that's an extreme example. I have the privilege to be able to do that with him. I would strongly recommend everybody to get out of their comfort zone. Everybody to, if they have a dream, if they had a dream the night before of an adventure of, that's curious to go on it, even no matter how fearful it is. It's a bit of a convoluted answer, but... Uh. Beautiful. Uh, wow. Uh, we have another very good question from Zoya. Uh, it's a long one, so let's go. The balanced notion was mentioned between cyberspaces and human experiences. Isn't it, isn't it similar to the imbalance that occurred with industrialization, creating consumerism culture that we're trying to fix now? Yeah, but then I would, the very simple answer is, then is it not too late? <laughs> I mean, that, that's a very sort of facetious answer. So look at what we created and look at how far removed and how far we've gone in our overconsumption, our overproduction and overconsumption. I would say we're almost too late in that context, but in the context of jumping into the digital world, into the metaverse, we're not too late. And I would hope we would learn our lessons from the mistakes that we made and are still making in our overproduction and consumption, not to make the same mistakes as we enter into the... I would take it even one step further mm. and say that I heard you mention, I don't remember in mm. what talk it was, but... Um, that either it's yeah that one of the things that you are doing mm -hmm. is that you go to the indigenous mm -hmm. people and mm -hmm. you try to tell them that hey please uh, you have something that we have lost mm -hmm. and wh what we have lost is very valuable mm -hmm. so please don't lose it mm -hmm. and over the past years there have been many many people so it's become more and more popular to say that aliens mm -hmm. are visiting the earth mm -hmm. and one of the reasons why they're doing that is because we have something that they have lost and so they're coming here because they want to reclaim that somehow or they mm -hmm. want to they want want to find it again. Mm -hmm. And the second way where I would go with that is do you know, know the T. S. Eliot quote? And it's not going to be a direct mm -hmm. quote. Basically, he said like, uh, at the end of all of our journeys, uh, it is our task basically to come back home where we first started and know the place for the very first time. And so I feel like w what you're doing is in a way doing exactly the same thing because we have veered so far off from where we used to be and now we're starting to feel with all the anxiety, all the depression, all the suicides, everything that is going on mentally in our worlds mm -hmm. that we have lost something and we want to get it back. So it's mm -hmm. almost like we've been on this long, long mm -hmm. journey and now mm -hmm. we've reached a point where we're starting mm -hmm. to turn back. The, the alien anecdote I know nothing about, although when I was younger I was accused of looking like an alien having no hair. <laughs> so that's the only familiarity I have with aliens. Um, as regards uh, communicating with these indigenous communities to be aware of what they could lose. At the same time, you have to be very careful with that conversation because who am I, as a middle-aged white man, to, so, to, to tell somebody what they should or they shouldn't do? It's a very colonialist attitude to say uh, to, to push them on a path. All I'm trying to do is, in this balance, is make uh, humbly make them aware of the wealth of their existence. Often they're very isolated, and now they become digitally connected. They become confused, and they may perceive that they're backward. What I'm trying to do is bring them into the conversation. We do this with our foundation. What they have is extraordinary. It's a wealth of individuality and authenticity that we're losing in our ever-evolving ever homogeneity. But at the same time, they are, have all the right to enter into the future as we are. And perhaps, but to do that in a healthier way. And to, in a way of bringing their heritage and their knowledge and their wisdom in balance into the developed world. And then becoming teachers and wisdom keepers for us. So it's not about staying in the past, it's about moving into the present, but re managing to perhaps re-educate us in how we could re reassess that balance. So not to give up, and it's not a desperate situation. There are human beings that are phenomenal examples of what it is still to feel 
and be in that relatively balanced space. Yeah. So one of the questions, or the uh, Zoya, I think that was, uh, who mentioned uh, a metaphor with the industrial revolution, mm -hmm. and I'm still trying to find maybe uh, another metaphor for uh, what the digital world is for us. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. perhaps, let's say, like a sword. Mm -hmm. So you have something that is extremely powerful, mm -hmm. but if you just have the power without having the wisdom again and uh, knowing the responsibility that comes with that power, then you're just going to go around chopping heads off and you're going to create the mess mm -hmm. and so it's uh, or the Carl Jung quote which is no tree uh, no tree can uh, reach to heavens unless its roots reach down to hell basically mm -hmm. and so it's it's I'm nice still quote. trying to some some way ah. try to know like w w what is the what is the journey that we have to go through and again I'm kind of asking the same question that I asked in the beginning mm -hmm. but what do we have to know what we do we have to learn so that we would have the right basically to use this technology without it completely shooting us off into the metaverse we have to um, trust the passage of time and live in that passage of time. I, th I think, again, and I'm middle-aged, so I'm jumping on the bandwagon of the digital area late. Uh, it's a shortcut to a variety of answers and a variety of experiences and a variety of uh, information. We have to to not want to go on that shortcut. We have to trust the process of the journey of life. We have to dare to want to make that journey, we were talking about it last night, as long as sustainable as possible. And to come up with a number of those answers, those insights that we need ourselves, personally, in an organic way, not through a digital source. I think that's the journey that you have to go on and believe in the longevity. I think a lot of us, uh, a lot of human beings are becoming cynical uh, for a variety of reasons in the developed world and don't believe in that longevity and the, 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 the purpose of it. If one goes on that, one, one dares to try to discover certain answers to the questions oneself, that's the adventure, that's the curiosity. And that's extremely important because a lot of those answers are outrageously profound and a lot of the experiences you have, but you have to be very, very patient to get close to them. And it takes a lot of time. Yeah, I yeah. also want to apologize mm. for everyone for my very uh, confusing questions because I'm trying to figure out what to ask as we're mm. going as well. And it's a, it's a very complicated topic because yeah. we're trying to understand something and we're not quite sure what we're trying to understand. Uh, well, I, I, I think if you, if you uh, let's simplify it. And I'm a bit of a simple soul. We were discussing it also last night, this idea I had as a child, a phenomenal existence up until the age of eight. I was feral. I lived in, on every different continent in the world with my father, who was an autistic geologist. That, that feeling of trust, that curiosity, that hunger, that love for myself and the world was killed at a very early age for a variety of reasons. A little voice has been alive in me from a very early age. Jimmy, that, that feeling, that existence is still there, but you have to reinvest and get back to it. Now at the age of 54, I feel that I'm reconnecting with the child, the child who dares, the child who's curious, the child who is incessantly wanting to open every door that he ever sees, have every conversation with every human being. But at the same time, there's an element, I hope, of humble wisdom after 54 years and bring the two parallel together. That, that's the journey we have to go on. And then you can attach yourself to the digital world to, to share, to provide insight, to provide information, but the two run parallel together. To trust and be patient, be patient to celebrate getting older, to celebrate that journey, that process, that time. The answers will not be found tomorrow. It may take 30 to 40 years. But when you get there, there'll be so much more insight, so much more connection to it. Yeah. Uh, beautiful. We have a couple of more questions, but because they're more personal on a personal note, so I'm going to ask them later. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, yesterday we also talked about uh, beauty. Mm -hmm. And uh, have you heard of the term, the hermeneutics of suspicion? Nope. So the hermeneutics basically is a way of interpreting old and biblical texts and, mm -hmm, and many mm -hmm. other things. And so hermeneutics of suspicion is basically a way of interpreting the world where appearances are always deceiving. Mm -hmm. So uh, truth is always behind something. Mm -hmm, Whether mm -hmm. it's like a conspiracy mm -hmm. theory in which mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there is a secret cabal who's running mm -hmm, something mm -hmm. or just the fact that if you look a certain way it's hiding who you really are mm -hmm. or 
if you say mm -hmm. something, you're trying to hide something. Mm -hmm. That's the hermeneutics of suspicion, interpreting everything mm -hmm. as if appearances were hiding mm -hmm. what is the what truth. Is the real truth. And one of the definitions, one of the most beautiful definitions of beauty that I have heard is mm -hmm. that beauty, in a contrast, is something that reveals truth, mm -hmm. that reveals mm -hmm. or discloses reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how can we connect that like because because the same way like with the metaverse for example mm -hmm. if you just go into the metaverse it's a beauty but it's just the mm -hmm. beauty of appearance and it's actually hiding reality from you but then you look at the beauty of many the indigenous mm -hmm. people and they're also very physically beautiful mm -hmm. but their beauty is disclosing it's showing us reality in some deep way you um this is a very very simple answer to a very very good question beauty is a feeling it's a state of being uh, when you go and visit an indigenous culture, they may not look as beautifully profound as I record them as being. But when you spend time and live and invest and connect, you end up interpreting and seeing them in a very, very different way. Hence, the result of the art is more art than journalism that I record. I'm sure that's very much the same for us. I'm often criticized, in a, and I find it an interesting criticism, that the indigenous communities that I see and record, they don't really look like like that. Well, it is my perspective, it's my truth, it's my interpretation of beauty, but I would flip it around and how do we perceive ourselves? Uh, nine, we don't ask the same questions about ourselves. When you walk into a, a magazine shop, for example, and you see this illustration of our aesthetic, it's an aspirational beauty. Nine times out of ten, the covers of a magazine are not as we look on a Saturday morning when we've woken up after a party, uh, but we never question it because it's an aspirational beauty, because we believe that we we have an authority to always be seen in that way. If you flip it and look at indigenous cultures, uh, it's the same. Having spent time, you end up seeing and interpreting it in a different in a different way. It's an inner beauty. It's an inner power. It's an inner aesthetic, which is also a truth. But that can only be seen after a long-term investment. That beauty that is personal, you have to invest in. You have to go on that journey. You have to go and look for it. We were talking about it earlier. And it takes time, and you have to be extremely patient. But it's an investment. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. to add to that, is there a way to make the metaverse, for example, uh, be beautiful in that true sense as well, and not be just an appearance of something aesthetically pleasing, but actually... Uh, being uh, an escape Good from question. reality. I, I, don't, I don't actually know whether I have the answer yet. I don't know. I think the, the time will tell whether it, it already is the metaverse. It is becoming this extraordinary existence. But whether that's an honest beauty, I would. Uh, ha uh, I don't want to be too cynical or negative. I find that difficult whether we're going to be able to keep the truth in it. Because the ease and the speed with which you can create an aesthetic uh, uh, will, will let us carry away from the investment that's needed. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to get to the questions now. There are a bit more uh, personal, but mm -hmm. let's see if we can tie them into the uh, larger conversation mm -hmm. as well. Uh, so Alex asked, hi, Jimmy, you started hi, with... Uh, with a book uh, before they pass away and uh, came to a big work homage to humanity which also we showed that photographic can tell in three years ago uh, can you tell me more about your evolution during these years um, good question uh, the evolution is and we touched on it last night we were talking is this never-ending journey of making the definitive picture, the one picture that will stand the test of time, the one picture that will hang on a wall that every individual that walks past will burst out into tears when they see it. I will never achieve that. I doubt whether anybody will ever achieve that. But the thrill to be on that journey, that complete and utter unadulterated love, fascination, obsession with the medium of photography, which I've often denied until recently, because I said it was just a medium to go on a different journey. I am I'm, I'm utterly obsessed with the medium and how that two-dimensional medium, that one stolen moment in time, that one fraction of a second or a whole second, depending on what camera you're using, is capable of capturing a feeling, a moment, and transcending uh, that to an audience. I often, what the journey I'm going on 
one, the best way I can describe it is if you can imagine a music recording. Music is very profound. And music is a way of touching our soul. You can have a, a vocalist, a drummer, and a violin, and they can play a song. Or you can have an orchestra with a choir of 2,800 drums and 84 violins, and they're both playing the same song. One is very easy and you just have the drum and the violin and the vocalist. And one takes three to four years to find a synthesis for all those voices and all those sounds. The journey that I'm on is that orchestra. I'm trying to make the creative process as complicated as fucking possible to, uh, to uh, so many layers that are almost unattainable for that one moment of connection. So much the same as when a conductor stands in front of that orchestra and everything is aligned and you sit in the audience and that sound resonates and touches your soul and you burst out into tears. I'm trying to do that in a visual way, but not with sound, not with movement, with nothing other than that piece of paper that will hang on the wall and that everybody who passes it, uh, I can connect with, with the journey that I'm going on, that idea of gathering all those senses, all those experiences, all those feelings and all those emotions in that one moment of time. And I think that's thrilling. I think it's totally impossible, but to aspire to uh, manifest it is the most exciting thing imaginable. And that is to counter this sort of uh, uh, indulgence in the digital world where everything is easy. I think by making something impossible, you go on a journey uh, as opposed to dealing with the result. And then that journey becomes totally sustainable. I will, for as long as I'm physically possible, spend the rest of my life looking for that one picture and that thrill. But it's everything I experience on that journey which makes this life as extraordinarily rich as I aspire for it to be. Does that make sense? Yes. And that's the journey that I'm on. So whether it's um, uh, regarded or acknowledged by anybody, I don't really mind anymore. It's so thrilling for me to aspire. And every time I make that pitch with the 10 by 8 and I, and I look at it, I go, oh, it's not perfect. And I get really excited because I have to go further and further and further and further. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, we had a commentary uh, which I can turn into a question. Basically, Zoya said that maybe digital tools are more like screwdrivers because swords are meant to kill, about uh, a metaphor I used earlier. But, but, but I would ask a question from that. The digital, uh, or sorry, the indigenous cultures that you've met, how do they see those technologies? Do they see this um, positive, negative, ambivalent? Uh, they are. There are differing layers of accessibility to indigenous culture. And there, some of them have no idea te technology exists. Some of them are touching on it. Um, they are. They see it as a form of connection, in word, but less in image. Uh, I've discovered more recently when I return to the communities that I've been working with, and I bring back the books I've made or the pictures I've made. They're often not very impressed. And I want to go back receiving accolades and gratitude and thanks. And they sort of look at it and often or not they will rip it up and put it in the fire or <laughs> give it to somebody else or somebody sits on it and it's a little bit more comfortable. And they, they often say, and we get into a conversation, and I said, well, why, why does this not interest you? And they said, well, this is your perspective on how you see us, uh, but we know how we feel. We're not really interested in how you see us. We don't need these pictures or we don't need mirrors uh, to tell us who we are. We know who we are. If this is how you see us, that's fine. The one thing that matters to us is you promised as a human being you would return back to us with what you'd taken, and that's much more important. So that's much more of a sort of a, a spiritual connection than a sort of a, a visible uh, document. So they themselves are not busy photographing themselves or mirroring themselves or recording themselves. They're busy living and being present. That's a simplification, a simple answer. Okay. Uh, do you yourself see technology as being ambivalent, as just being uh, a tool that if you're a good person, use it for good, if you're bad, use it for bad? Or do you feel that technology by itself has already some agency? Uh, technology will always have agency. Always have agency, and it's up to you as an individual to decide whether you're good or bad and how you're going to apply it and how you're going to use it. Um, I, I, the, uh, we as individuals have agency. And however we communicate and whatever we use for that communication, it's always going to be ambivalent. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Seem. Uh, comfort zone. Is your comfort zone being out of comfort zone? Good, good question. Um, uh, I, my comfort zone is being uh, physically, uh, emotionally and intellectually challenged. 
I think as a result of that, you all you keep growing. I think we as human beings are inherently uh, prone to being lazy. We're being lazy in our diet and our existence and our physicality and our communication. And one one dares to go continually confront that comfort zone. Uh, you you keep growing, and as a result of that, you're in continually energized. Although it's relative to the age and the physical physical capabilities of one's body and one's mind, and that's thrilling because the the journey becomes exponential. It becomes potentially unending for one as as long as one lives. Uh, the, you, one has to be careful with what that comfort zone is and what, what, whether, one, whether it's a true risk of danger or you're just touching the expression, touching the void, touching the potential danger. Beautiful. Um, okay, let's change topics a tiny bit, even though not really. Uh, and it's about... Uh, um, with all the... Uh, technology that we have right now, uh, especially with social media, what has happened is that we have placed, and also with loss of religion, mm -hmm. loss of tradition, mm -hmm. loss of all of that, we have placed all of importance mm -hmm. within ourselves mm -hmm. in a certain way, mm -hmm. and especially the way because we see mm -hmm. al ourselves mm -hmm. all the time mm -hmm. uh, in the indigenous uh, worlds. What you do is like, what's your value to the community? Mm -hmm. How do you serve mm -hmm. other people? Mm -hmm. How you're, you're uh, mm -hmm. seen seen by others? Mm -hmm. So it's it's much more oriented towards others mm -hmm. than it is towards ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, I at least believe, and I, I think it's, it seems quite obvious that the more we concentrate on ourselves and see ourselves as the source of meaning, source of uh, importance in our lives, the more we suffer, the more mm -hmm. we have anxiety, mm -hmm. depression, mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. else. So maybe let's just, I'm not even going to ask a question, but uh, again, what can we learn? What can we, what can we do? And is there a way that we can turn that same technology that has, has put us into this place uh, around to help us and not uh, drive us further off the cliff? Drive us further off the cliff is very melodramatic. Uh, yeah, we Sorry, have we, no, we, ha we have become a, a selfie generation. It's all about me, 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 me. Whether we like it or not, we're all becoming narcissists. Uh, narcissism is an extremely unhealthy human uh, trait. And it's, it's a burden. It's very damaging and it's a massive burden. Um, uh, how, to, how to resolve that? I, I'll be honest, I don't immediately have the answer because I see how addictive digital uh, and mobile technology is. In the short term, what I did with my son this summer is, a sort of a, is the beginning, whether or not that cons I can keep that as consistent. Um, now, I, I don't. I, I'll, honestly, I can sit here and waffle uh, indefinitely. I don't know whether I have the answer to that. I really don't know whether I have the answer to that. Um, other than touch on what we were touching on earlier, is be daring to disconnect, to ask uh, those uh, personal questions oneself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it, it is connected to the question that mm. we asked all of the mm. audience, so maybe it's mm -hmm. a good time to check just where the answers are right now. And so we can see that 13% uh, right now uh, say that technology uh, or the fact that we have cameras in our pockets has made us more indistinguishable, but this can be changed. 44% the majority are say that it's, it's making us indistinguishable from another and it's getting worse. And 38% uh, say that it has uh, helped us see the depth of each other mm -hmm. and our uniqueness in a better mm -hmm. way. And there is actually a few people, 6%, who say that it has rather made us more indistinguishable from one another and that's a good thing. I would, I would, I would lean on the group of 38%, that's the uh, positive group. Uh, talking about language, uh, it's the first time we can globally communicate with each other without using words. The fact that there are, I think it's estimated, three and a half billion photographers on the planet at the moment, so three and a half billion people speak the same language. Now, whether that language is true or a lie, that's the debate. But the fact that three and a half billion people can immediately communicate with each other through imagery and be more curious about imagery that I make and others made, I think is thrilling. So I would be optimistic and lean with the 38%. And, and ask everybody that's using it and thrillingly using it and thrillingly becoming photographers to try and stick as close as possible to the truth as they dare. But it's all about daring. 
Um, I'm just giving because we still have some time left. If anybody here as well wants to ask a question, just raise your hand and we will get the catch box to you. But um, in the meantime, uh, we stopped for a second on the uh, fact that for indigenous people, uh, it's about serving others, it's mm -hmm. about serving the community, mm -hmm. and it's and also... It's about it, serving the, na the, the natural world. Yes, and it's yeah. also known that one of the best ways to get out of depression, to get mm -hmm. out of a slump that mm -hmm. you're in, is not to focus more on yourself or try mm -hmm. to get help, it's mm -hmm. to actually try to help other people, mm -hmm. because uh, service is a very good anti mm -hmm. antidepressant. And so, I would like to know, like, within those... Um, Within those communities, how, like, what are the things that they value the most? What is what is that they say that, that they want? What do they want to do? How do they the, want to be a, seen? It's, it's a good, really good question about servicing others. And there's a, a reciprocity is extremely important. And if you look in the Pacific cultures, the whole uh, transfer of wealth system is based on a reciprocal process. And it's believed that the more you give, the more you'll get in the return. But maybe not in your lifetime, but in the lifetime of others there after you. So it's a completely different way of being. It's all about giving, and giving is wealth. And the less you have and the more you've given, the more wealthy your existence. But you may not benefit from that. It'll be generations after you. So I think that would be a fantastic sort of uh, uh, way, state of being that if we could bring into the developed world and leave this me, 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 the selfie, this narcissistic existence and think about how wealthy could others be after, after I pass through this passage of time. And then if you transfer that to the natural world, they invest an enormous amount of time because they believe they are, they're all animists in general. They're here to serve the natural world and to serve the natural world to make it as sustainable as possible. We've inverted it and we believe the natural world has to serve us. And that's the big dichotomy and that's what has to be, uh, has to be changed. So if you wake up in the morning and think, what can I do for others? What can I do for you, for you, for the natural world? That, that wealth of existence will become much more profound and richer in time. But it's not a material wealth, it's a wealth of being. Yes. Yeah. And also, when you said, like, if you give to others, you will get back more in, in return, but you might not get but it in this life. But mm. there is also mm. already an inher mm. inherent return in the fact that you're giving and it's making you feel good. Mm -hmm. And there is mm -hmm. an inherent, whatever is the opposite mm -hmm. of that, mm -hmm. in trying to get more for mm -hmm. yourself because you're mm -hmm. only focused on what you don't have. So you're mm -hmm. putting yourself in a trap. And mm -hmm. also, Something that I found out in my life is that feelings and things that you can endlessly quantify can never make you happy. Whether it's money, whether it's sexual partners, whether it's uh, fame, whether it's whatever. But the only things that really, really, really make us enjoy life, things like peace, th mm -hmm. th things mm -hmm. like gratitude, mm -hmm. things like love, mm -hmm. you either have it or you don't mm -hmm. have it. There is, mm -hmm. is no, I feel 75 love or I, I feel 54 gratitude. It's either you have it or you don't. And these are the things that uh, make us feel like, okay, life is good. And I feel that most of the indigenous people's lives uh, revolve around those things and not getting more and more and more. It revolves around one very, very specific state of being. And this is very, 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 very simple. And it's also something we can apply here is purpose. What is your purpose? Uh, they have a very clearly defined purpose. We have become numb to our purpose. What is our purpose? Where are we going to eat lunch? How big a car are we going to buy tomorrow? If we can transcend into that state of being, what is our purpose to be here as a human being? That will bring you in very close to moments of, of nirvana. And I think that's very much what we're looking for in this existence. We're losing because we're as we're connecting with the digital world, we're, we're going farther and farther and farther away from that purpose. Hence the state of relative unease or unhealth or unhappiness to reconnect back to what is my purpose as a human being and to not apply it into a religious context, but to discover it for oneself. That's extraordinarily fulfilling. And that's what the majority of the indigenous communities have. They have a very clearly defined state of purpose. And that's what becomes so attractive for me to connect to and try to communicate with the imagery that I make and the stories that I tell, that state of purpose. And it is to be found. Yeah. Uh, wonderful. Uh, time for next question. Uh, Margua, 
or uh, Margot, I don't know, uh, asked, in 1977, humanity sent 115 photographs to space forever on board Voyager spacecraft. Mm -hmm. If you had a chance to send one of your pictures to space as a representation of mankind, which image would you pick? That's oh. a very beautiful question. Oh, stunning question. Um, stunning question. The the the. It's a very. It's a picture of mine. It's a very bad picture. It's made 26 years ago. It's very difficult to define what's on the picture, but it's the picture of my eldest daughter being born. The miracle of life. Uh, it's that moment where her head was popping out of the vagina of my now ex-wife. And there was a lot of noise, although that's not recorded on the picture. It's black and white, it's grainy. I was in tears. I was very young, very naive, but it's that particular moment. It's, it's the, the beauty of, uh, of creation. That's the one picture uh, I would send into space. That's Although you can't see her face, you only see the top of her head and the squeezing of the vagina. But Maybe you can follow. It's very artistic, very right? abstract. It could be seen as art. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's also interesting as a res I'm, I'm, I try I'll go off on a segue. Uh, if you, another question I've been asked, and I'll ask to myself now: What are the pictures you regret having not made? It's her going through puberty because she. I'm fascinated with that journey of from child to adult. I had a very complicated process from puberty to adulthood, and I saw her as a very profound, very rich, very intelligent woman go from a girl to a woman. And I would have loved to have recorded that process in the most intimate way imaginable, but she refused me because she said I was born, the day I was born I had a camera attached to my head, and up until the age that I could choose that I didn't want a camera. Um, so those are the pictures I wish I hadn't taken, but I have the memory of seeing her grow into a, the extraordinary woman that she now is, although there isn't a picture of it. Uh, but there are, but they're not good. Wonderful. Before I'm gonna, uh, well, before, I'm, yeah. before I'm gonna get to the next question, maybe we can also touch for a second uh, upon the importance of uh, coming to age rituals and uh, uh, rites of passage. I know this is something that we talked about when I visited mm -hmm. you two mm -hmm. years ago, mm -hmm. and I still feel that it's such an important uh, part that our culture has basically lost. And I also feel that it might be one of the keys that uh, can be helpful to be more responsible with the technology that we have, mm -hmm. whether it's a sword, mm -hmm. a screwdriver, mm -hmm. or a camera. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, It's a really good question, and the, this isn't prepared, but I automatically have two stories I want to align with it. It's a personal story, and it's a story about the Huli in Papua New Guinea. Uh, I went on a very complicated journey as a child from early childhood through to adolescence to adulthood and the, the tipping point, the bridge was losing my hair. Uh, that was the de redefinition of my aesthetic, my identity. I lost my hair because of extreme stress and a multitude of other reasons which we're not going to go into now but if you go online you can find out why. And I woke up one morning and looked in the mirror and saw a different face. Fuck. That sent me on a new journey. I ran away, disappeared off into Tibet, dressed as a monk. I'm still here today, bald. But fascinatingly, not so long ago, about four years ago, I was in Papua New Guinea in one of the many different with the Huli, and they have a ritual, which I didn't know at the time, but they took me on the journey of, which has to do with hair, which I thought was a beautiful bridge. What they do with their teenagers is they, over a period of one and a half years, and right in the middle of their puberty, they gather them as they're leaving puberty, and with a shaman, they enter into the rainforest. It's a high altitude rainforest, and for a period of a year, and they walk into that rainforest naked with no clothing, no food, no tools, no nothing, just a group of, on average, 30 teenagers. And for a year, they have to find a way to symbiotically come into balance with the natural world. They have to sustain themselves. They have to sustain one another. And most importantly, what they have to do is they have to grow their hair. And they're Melanesian, so they have an afro. But they have to grow their hair in a very specific way. They have to grow their hair into these very large bowls. Now, you think, why into the shape of a bowl? It's very abstract, but I think it's wonderfully beautiful because it's the most awkward shape that you could ever have your hair into when you're lying for a year in a rainforest without a bed, without any pillows, without nothing. And you have to groom. They have to groom each other day in and day out. 
all day to make these bowls, these afros, into these magnificent bowls. At the end of the year, the shaman checks them all. So you're the 30 teenagers, and you all have to have the most perfect bowl and have fed yourself and be healthy and not be ill and still like each other and not be fighting, but it's about the bowl. Having lived with that bowl-shaped head in the jungle means you found a way to physically and mentally and psychologically become one with the natural world, whilst at the same time creating this very androgynous, strange form. Then he says, you all passed, you go back to the village. Then they have a ceremony all together, and the elders come and they check the hair that it's correct. Then they ritualistically shave off this bowl, and they build a little uh, structure underneath it, and they say, this is your hat. They call it, this is the wig, this is the holy wig. Now, you have to go on your own, not with the group, not with the shamans, for six months back into the natural world, and reconnect with it, but, but create your identity, your aesthetic, your authenticity into that hat, into that wig. And when you've done that, and when it's utterly unique, and when you've utterly discovered your story, you're allowed back into the village. So six months later, they come back into the village, and each one of them has created their own design of this wig. And then they put it on, they all stand in a line, they paint their faces yellow, and have the most magnificent party that you could ever imagine. There are no drugs involved whatsoever, but it's one and a half years investment in transition from child to man, of fear, of danger, of aesthetic, of identity, of questioning. And on average, they're 17 or 18 when they achieve that. And it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever witnessed and seen and experienced. And then as it was happening, I managed to sort of segue to my own experience. I thought, what a beautiful irony that I started my journey by losing my hair. I don't have any wigs. But I did go on this lifelong, still today, journey of discovering connection with my authenticity, my creativity, my feelings, my emotions, based on an aesthetic. And uh, so by default, I am on a lifelong journey of what they achieved or in one and a half uh, years. And it's beautiful. Every one of these indigenous communities has these traditions, has these rituals. Many of them are not documented. They're so profound. They're so extraordinary. But they require effort. They require work. They require fear. They require failure. Everything. They require judgment. They tears, pain, scars. But oh, it makes you so human. Yeah. Does that uh, make any sense? Oh yes, it and there does. are no pictures, but it, it's it's oh, who the f excuse my friend, uh, who the fuck am I, and what do I feel, and why am I here, and yeah, but you have to be pushed to discover that, and it's based on an aesthetic, it's based on beauty, but it's based on a tradition, it's based on being a, a community, it's based on others, and yeah. So maybe one of the things that we can uh, let people think for themselves, because I don't think we're going to be able to answer that today, but is like what would be the rite of passage to be a member of the digital world so that you're not just uh, an angry um, troll <laughs> on the internet, ruining your own and everybody else's life. May, like maybe this is what we have, because we have this amazing technology and we don't have a rite of passage for it. You okay. can be a four-year-old okay. with no experience again, and you can... Again, I, I organically think of an immediate answer, and it's what I used earlier, and we talked about it yesterday, that quote from Brad Pitt in a magazine the other day, and he he's in his late 50s, and he said something I thought was very, very, very beautiful. He said, uh, we're all in a film. He is obviously in many films and a famous actor, but he says, we're all as human beings in a film. We're all our own director. We're all, all our own script writer and producer. But at the end of the day, we're the only ones who will ever see the film. So uh, when you get put that into context and you wake up to that fact, then I think it could be a very enriching journey. And if you dare, and then we had a question last night, uh, can it ever be beautiful to be lonely? Can you ever find a happy space? Then if you dare to answer that question and go on that journey, produce, film, direct, write, score, edit, and then sit on your own and watch the film that you created and nobody else, then perhaps you can. But it's an investment. It's a massive fucking investment. Uh, and it takes a whole life. Uh, yeah. Before I ask the next question, I would like to also remind something, because I feel there is something that people have 
completely forgotten about or never thought about. And it's that even if, let's say, we can all escape into the metaverse and it's going to be amazing, we're going to feel no pain, there's going to be no problems, just press a button and you'll feel mm -hmm. amazing and see everything you want to see. We have to remember that what I'm holding in my hand right now, what you have here right now, what you're seeing this on, uh, everything around us, the physical materials to build this, a lot of this was mined by slaves, by uh, small children in, in the Congo who mm -hmm. work in cobalt mines that we need for all the lithium batteries, is that even if we create the metaverse, the physical material for us to be in there still comes from a lot of physical pain, a lot of physical effort. It's not, it doesn't come mm -hmm. from the air, it doesn't come from the ether. Mm -hmm. So it's still built mm -hmm. with blood, sweat and mm -hmm. tears and mm -hmm. a lot of human uh, mm -hmm. suffering. Mm -hmm. And I feel this is something that we can't forget, even though our world tries to not, not, that not only us. that, think about the energy that it requires and where does that energy come from. Yeah. yeah. But it's a, it's a highly complicated subject. I think it's a thrilling subject to discuss. As I was discussing with your grandmother earlier, she says uh, we have to go further than just having conversations. If it's only just words, then I'm wasting my time sitting here listening and also I'm wasting my time talking. I would ask you to be brave, ask you to dare to go on that journey and and use technology to, 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 to initiate it, but to look for the answers within. And they hurt, and they're, they're, they're dangerous, and they're confronting, and they're terrifying. But they can also be extraordinarily enriching. And I look at a few of the younger people in the audience, and um, I strongly recommend it to you, because uh, life can become outrageously rich as a result. But it has nothing to do with the bank account, because I've got nothing on my bank account. And also, uh, relating to us yeah. here in Estonia, it's, it's also very hard for us to realize, I think at least, and, or maybe it's just for me and not for everybody else, is that when we think about saving indigenous cultures, we think of the people that you have photographed, with the huli and so on, mm -hmm. we don't think of our culture, mm -hmm. which we have right here in Estonia, mm -hmm. in bogs, in forests, mm -hmm. we have amazing, amazing things that nobody else in the world mm -hmm. has, mm -hmm. and because we're so used to that, Mm -hmm. then we're like, oh, well, this is not an indigenous mm -hmm. culture. Indigenous mm -hmm. cultures live in the mm -hmm. Amazon or, or mm -hmm. they live some, somewhere else, you know. Mm -hmm. But for, for us to make it, again, mm -hmm. practical for something that we have to do, we have to keep our traditions alive. We have to, yeah. Yeah, but it, and, it, and it's a nice bridge to the beginning of the pandemic. I, was, I live in Amsterdam, based in the Netherlands. Uh, everybody was around me more in panic for me. Jimmy, you're not going to be able to travel. Uh, but because I was in quite a positive space, I ended up creating a project in the Netherlands, the 20 indigenous cultures that still exist in the Netherlands, traditions. And it's turned out to be as aesthetically pleasing, rewarding, enriching, inspiring as anything you would have ever found at the far end of the world. I also had the privilege to have a, an exhibition here in Fotografiska right at the beginning in Tallinn. And from that day till today, uh, I made it a uh, bee in my bonnet to make sure that I come back here one day and aesthetically, artistically document the traditional heritage that you still have here. So next year, if all goes to plan, inshallah, we will be doing a, a, um, a, a co-project with Fotografiska and I will be spending a long period of time here as long as possible celebrating what you still have here. Not saying that you'll have to run around dressed in traditional clothing, but to aesthetically acknowledge it, celebrate it, use it as a record, as a mirror to connecting with the stories of your ancestors and understand the validity of them and the aesthetic of them and then perhaps celebrate that and bring that into the rest of the world and show the authenticity and uniqueness of Estonia. And then if everything goes to plan, and I love to manifest, this will become part of a bigger project on your Europe. And I think especially at this moment in time, for a variety of reasons, and we're not going to mention any names, that understanding of identity and that celebration in a positive way is needed more than ever before. So as you, with you and Fotokafiska and Estonia being the catalyst, I think we're going to produce something extraordinary. And it's not about going back into the past, it's how will we re-identify our authenticity as we move into the future. Yeah. And it'll take an enormous amount of effort and pain and scars, but it's worth it. <laughs> uh, relating to that, uh, Sven asked 14 minutes ago, hello Sven, what do you think of Estonians? As an outsider, do you see patterns that we probably don't see ourselves? I'll be very honest, Sven, let's have this conversation in a year's time, okay? Because I'm not, I'm not capable of answering that at the moment. 
at the moment uh, I've visited here a number of times, but my experience has been very lovingly, but very superficial, and I need to invest. And once I've invested, then I'll be able to give a more objective, honest answer. But I have all positive uh, uh, aspirations that it's going to be amazing. Uh, we still have uh, some more minutes left, so I'm uh, once again asking if anybody here has any questions, we can throw you the catchbox microphone and you can, you can ask anything. Uh, until you don't, I'll ask a few more questions. Uh, one is, has there been anything so far that we haven't covered uh, concerning the digital world, indigenous con cultures that uh, would be important to bring up? I think it's extremely important to invest and understand the power of the digital world and rather than just let it take over and consume us, learn how it's made, what it entails, what are the consequences of it. So not just let it become a tsunami of possibility, but go on that journey and understand its source and where it comes from. And even if you're digitally inept, which I am, uh, dare to try and understand the significance and the consequences of it. Coincidentally, Time magazine at the moment, its cover article is the metaverse, and it's a very profound eight-page story on how it will take over the world and the dangers of it. So that's a good um, beginning. Uh, something that I want to ask you is, if you could teach a course on any subject to anyone, mm -hmm. what would it be? And why? Uh, 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 understanding the selfie. And it would be a very narcissistic journey of standing in front of a mirror for an extended period of time. <laughs> and go on that conversation. And um, that's what I would teach. I, between the ages of 16 and 30, I didn't look in a mirror. And any form of reflective surface I could not uh, see or be confronted by. And eventually, I, not that I spend all day now looking in a mirror, but as a me metaphor, I think that's a very, very important course for us all to go on and stand in isolation, in complete and utter silence uh, with one's own uh, visual identity and have a conversation with it. That's the course I've uh, and make it as long and as intense and as complicated as possible. There is something called a true mirror. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard about it. Mm -hmm. You can buy a mirror which doesn't show you the mirror reflection of you, mm -hmm. but it shows you as others see you. Mm -hmm. So it has like another type of mirror Blemishes. inside. Yeah. yeah, so so yeah. you see the way, like when you look uh, at yourself uh, on uh, photographs, uh, why we all see, feel like, oh, I'm so awkward, I don't mm -hmm. normally look that bad. Mm -hmm. So there's a mirror that actually mm -hmm. shows that to you uh, okay. all the time. Okay. Um, there was something else that I wanted to mention. Yeah, I think the last thing, if you don't want to mention anything else, and if uh, nobody has any more questions, I'm going to just ask you the same question that I asked you uh, yesterday, mm -hmm. which is like, we all mostly know what we want, what we desire, but mm -hmm. what do we want to want? What should we want to want? And I'm going to re-answer and try to make it more concise than I did yesterday. What are we really uh, ask me the question again? What we what do we what should we want to want? What should we want to want is that all of humanity submits and goes on the journey of sustainability, and everything we do, everything we say, everything we act, everything we consume, is based on a reinvestment in the planet, in one way or another. That is what that is what we should want to want. And it should not be about us, it should be about the generations that uh, will follow us in return. And that wealth of in reinvestment uh, should be what we want to want. And then not about us, it's about the future of the planet. And how you do that, uh, you can do that in a multitude of ways, but it should be about this, not about me. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, well, I think we're going to end with that once again checking the question and I'm going to read the question out once again. The question that we asked was, has the fact that we all have cameras in our pockets made us more aware of every individual's uniqueness or rendered us indistinguishable from one another? And uh, the answers that we got now, it's 50% say that it has made us more indistinguishable and it's getting worse. So quite a negative view, mm -hmm. but you turn the tables around uh, for the positive as well, because 35% of people say that it's rather helped us to see the depth of our individuality and uniqueness better. And 10% uh, says made us more indistinguishable, but it can, can be changed. And only 5%, thank God, say that it has made us more indistinguishable and it's a good thing. 
So although, although I went down from 38 to 35, so I'm not a very good salesman. But we went up with, uh, <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, that's, that <laughs> is correct. Uh, as, that is correct, months. yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay. Anyway, uh, this was our talk today by uh, Photographis Catalin and uh, Delia Inspira. Uh, also, thank you to uh, Votemo for uh, providing uh, the uh, beautiful platform that we can use to answer the questions. And uh, so thank you everybody uh, here at Pai Darvomus Festival as well for uh, listening. And a uh, big round of applause for Jimmy Nelson. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to you. Thank you to you in the audience. And thank you, Alexander, for your uh, intellect. Thank you. And uh, thank you, everybody, thank for you, uh, watching on Facebook, on Delia Inspira. And uh, see you soon, hopefully. Bye-bye.